Welcome to the Be The Change podcast with your host, Ralph Harper. On this podcast, he shares his vision for the future of the United States. Think of this podcast as somewhat of a roadmap to times in the future on a continuum from a dark past to the 2060s. Yep, that's right. He's a forward thinker whose purpose is to dictate positive outcomes for our children and our country versus leaving it all to chance. Ralph will cover parenting, fatherhood, accountability, and what it takes to win in this great nation. It's not just Ralph. He will have difficult conversations with other thought leaders of different backgrounds and political affiliations. It's time to get started. Here's your host, Ralph Harper. John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So why don't people want to know the truth? Could it be that they just don't want to be set free? But I guess there are a lot of reasons why people don't want to know the truth. And my particular experience has proven to me that certain people are actually fearful of the truth, especially as it relates to bad news. You see, negative truths can be painful and emotionally draining sometimes. However, on the other hand, avoiding and running from the truth can be unforgiving and in some cases deadly. I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story of a woman who spent her entire life committed to raising her 10 children. And in her later years, she started to feel a pain in her stomach and she had maybe have seen blood in her uh, stool when she went to the restroom. And for whatever reason, she seemed to make a conscious decision to ignore those warnings and those truths about what was happening to her body. She didn't want to go to the doctor to have anything confirmed. Again, she was fearful of knowing the truth about the possibility she might have cancer. She avoided that truth for so long that the cancer completely consumed her body. She died a very slow and painful very painful death. I watched her. She was my mother. And I know in my heart that had my mother just made a conscious, a very conscious decision to go to the doctor and be screened and to have a colonoscopy, that she might be with us today. She might still be with us today. And unfortunately, my mother passed away when she was just 62 years young. 62 years young. And she died from a disease that is almost 100% curable if you just catch it early and do the right things. But sometimes people are just fearful of knowing the truth and the consequence of running away from the truth can be deadly. I want to share another story with you, which is a little bit different from the one I just talked about. And I've told the story before, but it's it's very compelling to me because, um, again, it's one of those situations where, you know, when you have an opportunity to do something about uh, your health by simply knowing what's going on with you, then you should do it. So I recall sitting in my office in Addison and... um, And over the course of several months, I had had this cough. And I would cough a lot. And and one day I was in my office and I was was coughing so badly that um, one of my employees came in. Her name is Lenore. She came into my office. She says, wow, are you okay? And I could barely talk. I I could barely catch my breath. And she brought me some water and I just continued to cough. And um, she... You know, we, we went through this whole exercise of me trying to explain, but I was still coughing. The water helped a little bit. 
But I recall later that week, and I was talking to a friend, and I told her, I said, you know, this cough that I have may be more serious than I think. And I'm a little bit concerned because my brother Steve had throat cancer. And I know that my brother, I assumed that my brother had throat cancer because he smoked for over 30 years and I had never smoked um, in my life other than for the 20 seconds or so when I tried to smoke a cigarette that my father had left in the in the ashtray and I choked on it for like about 35 seconds. I couldn't breathe and I decided at that point that smoking cigarettes was definitely not something I wanted to do. But anyway, let me get back to the story I was telling about my friend when I told her that I thought I might have cancer and I wanted to go and have an EN, uh, ENT check, check my throat out and check my larynx out. And her response was, why would you do something like that? You don't have cancer. Don't even talk that into your life. Now, first, I have no idea what that means. Don't talk that into your life. But I listened to her for a while and I listened to her reasoning in terms of why she didn't think I should go and have my um, self checked out to see if I had cancer. Um, but then, you know, I, I thought about it and I, I decided on my own that this was important to me. And I decided that I was going to go to an ENT and have myself checked out. And so I did. And when I did, they took this tube and they went down, the scope went down my nose and they checked me out and checked my larynx out. And there it was. The doctor found a couple of polyps on my larynx. And he came back to me with the news. He's like, wow, you know what? I think you should see a specialist about this. And um, he says, I don't think it's anything serious. It doesn't look that serious to me, but I think you do need to see a specialist. And he gave me the doctor's name. Her name was Dr. Avizio. And so I scheduled an appointment. I went to see her and um, they did a biopsy initially and um, decided that um, they wanted to, um, to, do, to perform surgery. Well, as it turned out, they performed the surgery and uh, the first one and it turned out the cells were precancerous. Six weeks later, I went back for my follow-up and uh, apparently she didn't get it all out. So she gave me the news again that I had to have a second uh, surgery and it came back with the same result. Um, these cells were precancerous. And I'm, I'm completely dumbfounded because first of all, the first surgery was, was not fun to go through and I couldn't talk for several months. And if you know me, uh, all of my friends know that I like to talk. So when I had the second surgery, I had to go through this. But I tell these stories because this is really important because had I listened to my friend, had I made a conscious choice to listen to my friend and not go get checked out at all, then I might have found myself in the same predicament that my brother is in. My brother had to go through several rounds of chemo and radiation to cure his cancer. He's been cancer free for several years, but the treatment caused him um, uh, a lot of problems. And his esophagus is swollen up on the inside and, and he can barely breathe and they had to put a trach in his throat and the only way that he can speak is by covering that hole up in his throat to talk. This is this is so important to me because when we have opportunities to listen and just know the truth, then we have an opportunity to do something about that truth. You see, I'm not a I'm not a perfect person, but I always try to tell the truth, and I don't have a 100% track record in that regard. But I try to tell the truth. I try to be truthful. And most of you know I write, and I write a lot, and I have a lot to say on different uh, social media platforms. I've written a couple of books. So I have a lot to say, and I like to, 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 to write what I have to say down. And people challenge me often because of some, some of my views and some of the things I write. One common thing that I get from a lot of my uh, black American um, 
friends, people who I love, and and they they're like family to me in some cases. But they ask me, why do you always have to air our dirty laundry? They ask me why I have to tell the truth about the black American situation, and they suggest to me that I'm airing our dirty laundry. And my response to that is that it's a pretty simple notion. Um, the emperor has no clothes. That means that the emperor is completely exposed and that is the case with the plight of black American people in the United States of America. Everybody already knows. They know our history. They know what goes on in our communities. They know our particular situations. All of it, all of it, the complete picture is exposed. There are a lot of data points that outline and tell truths about black American people and our comportment and our experiences in the United States of America. There are no secrets in this regard. It's just out there and everybody knows. And I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that we have to stop pretending that no one knows but us. Everybody knows. So when we have these data points and we'd rather cling to them and hold on to them and pretend that no one else can see them and no one else knows exactly what's happening with us, for each day we make conscious choices to do that, we mitigate any chance of doing something about the plight that exists in our communities and in our, in our families and within our friend circles and the whole nine yards and especially when it comes to our children because there are some pretty compelling numbers that tell very profound stories about our children and our reality is that if we're not willing to do anything about this today then none of us, not a single one of us, should be surprised when our children are failing. We have opportunities to work with our kids in ways that could make them so much better than we were. We have opportunities to make our children grow, grow up to be. In spite of your success today, we can make our children even better than you in spite of your success. We just have to accept certain truths and go do something about it. Now, I know I've, I've talked about this several times and if you've listened to any of my podcasts, you have heard me mention these facts. Um, the fact is that in the United States of America, approximately 32 million adults are illiterate. Black American people represent a pretty significant piece of that number. But let me be clear about something. Illiteracy does not impact black American people differently than it does white American people or Hispanic people or Chinese people or anyone else. The impact is congruent. It is the same, almost. And that is one of those realities where, wow, I, I talk about this so much because this is a tough one because I, I did a live video uh, about two weeks ago and I was talking about this whole notion of illiteracy. And I talked about the man who um, is so embarrassed about the fact that he's illiterate He's so embarrassed, he's not even willing to ask someone for help. And because of illiteracy, the same man can't even help himself. 
So the problem stays within him and it perpetuates until that man gets to a place of appreciating the fact that he has this problem and he's willing to do something about it. He's willing to call a friend and say, hey, listen, I, gotta, I have to tell you the truth. And this is one of the hardest things that you could ever imagine a grown man actually doing. It's calling someone and saying to him, man, I can't read and I need help. And I want you to keep this between us, but I want you to do something to help me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that man getting the help he needs and turning his life completely around because reading is the most foundational thing that you can do to be successful in this country. And I've said it before, and I think I may have said it in the last podcast, there is no alternative for that. There's no alternative for that. And this is a huge problem in the black American community. And as long as we're not willing to talk about it, then I can tell you unequivocally, we will not do a damn thing about it. We have to talk about it. We don't have a choice. Someone's got to say something in order for someone else or somebody to do something this is real. This is a foundational problem that needs to be addressed. And it may be something that has been driven down. And I've said this before. I believe a lot of things that sometimes we experience has been driven down through the whole slave experience. But either way, this is something that needs to be addressed. And until we make conscious choices to say, hey, listen, you know what? We can fix this, and when we do, we can see the benefits of that on the back end because some of these other statistics are pretty compelling as well. And it's interesting because, again, this is not just a black thing. Even when you hear some of the national numbers, you have to think, wow, that, th those aren't good numbers, actually. So let's talk about this for a second. When it comes to fourth grade reading, only 18% of black Americans are proficient in reading at the fourth grade level. With math, black Americans are 19% proficient. That means that 19% of black Americans are proficient at the fourth grade math level. Let's take it up a notch and go to the eighth grade. Black Americans in the eighth grade are 16% proficient in reading. When it comes to math, black American kids, 8th graders, only 13% of them are proficient in math. But let's stop for a second because I want to share some interesting numbers with you uh, regarding the national averages. And this is not exciting news at all. I mean, Think about this. The national average fourth grade reading, only 36% of fourth graders are proficient in reading. And when it comes to the fourth grade regarding math, only 40% of them are proficient in fourth grade math. Eighth grade, national numbers, only 34% of 8th graders, this is all-inclusive again, because it's a national average, are proficient in 8th grade reading, and 40% of 8th graders are proficient in math. So if any of you are interested in, interested in the source of these numbers, please feel free to go to ralphharper.com under um, my uh, podcasts and I think that data is sitting out there and available for you to either drop down as a PDF or something like that but definitely you can read it there but I, I wanted to share these numbers because these are the kinds of numbers that really should create some level of a sense of urgency for us to do something 
especially when it comes to our kids and mostly when it comes to our kids it's it's really hard to to read these numbers and to just anyone who's um capable of just knowing the value of reading and knowing the value of, of just being educated and and man you got to look at those numbers and, and you it's it's easy to imagine that if kids continue to fall short in these areas especially related to to reading it's going to be hard for them to find work it's going to be hard for them to just exist uh, in this country and wow when you know these numbers and we we obviously just by knowing we have an opportunity to do something to 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 uh, provide some kind of solution to it um, when we sit back and we decide and make conscious choices not to do anything about it then then I suggest uh, anyone who's willing to do that is is complicit in this little problem we have. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you're, you're, you're somewhat accountable when you know that it's a problem and you're not doing anything about it. I mean, yesterday I was uh, at the store and um, I saw a police officer and he was standing outside a car and it was weird for me because I saw this 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 man he's standing outside the car and he's laughing um, i'm not used to police officers just laughing and joking around with um with adults when they stop them they're usually very serious but this police officer was standing there and joking around and i looked closely and there were two little children in the back seat of the car and he was joking and laughing with these kids and i don't know what he was saying to them that made him, made them laugh so much and i don't I have no idea what they were saying to him that made him burst out laughing and he was laughing loudly and it was, it was just funny to watch. And then I realized someone had left those damn kids in the car. It was almost 100 degrees yesterday. Had someone not called the police, those kids might have died and they wouldn't have had a chance to joke around with that police officer or go home with their mother that day. So what I'm suggesting is that police officer knew what was going on there. Someone else in the parking lot knew what was going on there. They knew that was a problem to have a kid sitting in the back seat of a car when it's 100 degrees outside and the windows are rolled up because children die that way a lot and they die that way a lot in the state of Texas. My point is that someone made a conscious decision to do something about those kids in that car and it saved their lives. So again, I use that analogy and that truth, that story to just, just be honest about the fact that, hey, listen, I'm giving you data points today about situations in the black American community and in other communities around the country that has to do with the literacy and it has to do with education and it has to do with working in our country. And I'm saying, wow, we have to start doing better at placing the right level of focus on this and doing it in a way that is strategic and broad reaching so that we can eradicate illiteracy in this country. And I know sometimes people are willing to sit back and say, oh, well, that's not, that's not possible. But I can tell you right now, when we start our kids out reading at age three years old, you have no idea what the possibilities are. But if we sit idly by the way we do sometimes now, knowing our kids can't read, we know exactly what that outcome looks like. And it doesn't have to be that way. For each minute that we don't do anything, then we are complicit in the outcome of this dilemma. So I'm coming to you today again to plead with you. I've, I've written a whole book about a lot of things we could be doing with our kids because this is something that's very important to me. And um, I wrote this book knowing with absolute certainty that this is not something I can solve on my own. 
I wrote that book knowing that I need people to come on board to place more focus on this issue. We need to place more focus on this issue around the country starting today. And uh, my book is less about selling books. It's more about getting a message to our kids and getting a message to parents and other adults who have influence over children so we can get them the right message. Starting at age three years old, I'll say it again, our children should be learning to read because when they do that, by the time they're eight years old, they're reading because they absolutely want to read and they enjoy it. And I can tell you, I can tell you that when we get this right, you will see the outcomes. You will see the outcomes very prominently displayed across generations. It will be an amazing thing to witness 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now. And these same children and their children and their children's children will have been impacted by them reading early in their lives. So like I said in my live video a couple of weeks ago, in this day and age, there is absolutely no particular reason why a child should grow up and become an adult and be illiterate. It just, it just shouldn't happen. And I know, I know if, if any parents are listening to this, I know that you do not want your child to grow up illiterate. You do not want your child to grow up uneducated. You do not want your child to grow up to be an adult unemployed. You do not want your child to grow up being unaccountable for his or her choices. You do not want your child to grow up just being completely disrespectful you don't want your child to grow up having not done anything to serve anybody or to support anyone else. You don't want your child to grow up and not be successful and not be prosperous. These are the kinds of values that we need to continue to instill in our kids and until we start getting it right, then most of us already know. We already know what the outcomes will be because many of us, including me, we've already already experienced it. We've already experienced it. A lot of us have grown up and we've lived our lives the hard way, learning as we went along. We can't keep missing opportunities to give our kids the answers up front. We have an accountability to do that. Give our kids the answers up front so that they don't have to go through the roller coaster ride that we went through, just figuring it out on our own. I know there are a lot of people out there like me who are, you have to be agreeing with me because I know there are a lot of folks out there who have gone through this and they know that had they done things differently as a child, their lives would have turned out much better. And I say that, I say that in spite of the fact that there are certain people who are very successful. They have matriculated through college and gotten their master's degrees and they've worked in fortune companies. 
But I tell you, there are millions of people out there who would be willing to admit, to admit well, they learned things the hard way. And when we have an opportunity to guide our children appropriately and we don't, we put our kids in predicaments where they will be forced to go through that whole life experience on their own, repeating some of the exact same mistakes that their parents and other grown-ups within their realm, repeating some of their same mistakes when they don't even have to because it's so much easier to just give our kids the answers up front, give them what they need to be equipped to su to succeed in this country. And I know that everybody is not in a place where they can't do that, but that's why we need to have access to mentoring programs and all these other places so that our kids are um, being guided some way. And um, I, this stuff is important to me, and sometimes I know that I'm repeating it again and again, but at the end of the day, when we tell these truths about where we are, and if we're not willing to set our kids free, then we can't, um, then we, we just know. We know what the outcomes are going to be. We know what the outcomes are going to be. So I just want to just, just, uh, I'm just going to just close this out by suggesting to you that, you know, there are certain things that we do. Um, there are certain things that politicians are always talking about. Uh, one thing that is a pet peeve of mine is the fact that we're always touting this notion that, hey, listen, you know, the unemployment rate for black American people is always double the national average. And I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because it's important to me, Right. When there are 2.5 to 3 million information technology jobs open and only 6% of those jobs are filled by black American people, a part of the reason is that black American people are not skilled for those jobs. We need to be guiding our kids to those tough courses those 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 roads less traveled, if you will. Those are the jobs that are good paying jobs and they will be around for the long haul. We just have to be smart about, hey, listen, how do we inspire and engender our children to want to take that path that may be perceived a little bit tough? We still have to let them know about the rewards of being one of the top information technology security um, resources in the entire country. And those are the kinds of things that we have to do. Um, we have to expose our kids to certain possibilities so that they can make the right choices. We have to tell them the truth about the consequences of falling short on reading and falling short on being educated. We have to give them these answers so that um, so that they can be better equipped to uh, to do things the right way in this country because I've said it before, there are two things required to be successful in the United States. What are you willing to do and where are you willing to do it? So, thank you so much for listening to me today. Um, I'm really excited and I think I mentioned this before as well. I'm, I'm sure I have because I'm going to mention it again. But my, um, my book is being pre-sold right now and it's actually being pre-sold in a number of different places including... Uh, Amazon, including um, Target, um, Ingram's Books. Uh, there's, uh, has a broad network of uh, booksellers in there, and some of those folks are starting to pre-order. Uh, my, my new book is called Own the Change. Own the Change, How Black American Children Can Further the Next Generational Movement. And it can be, uh, you can check it out at shop.ralphharper.com and um, thanks again for listening uh, I will be back again next week with some new stuff and um, uh, I appreciate you bearing with me today and I know it's hard sometimes to hear the truth but we have to do a better job of listening to the truth and just acting upon it be blessed 
Thank you for joining us on Be The Change. Be sure to subscribe today and don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best conversations. Visit ralphharper.com for show notes, resources, and events. To support Be The Change, please join our patron community at patron.com forward slash ralphharper. Be The Change returns the same time next week and is brought to you by the 2060s Project.